Good morning. We welcome you to our service this morning, and we're glad to begin our worship service with a baptismal service. It's always a great honor and a great privilege for our church to be able to uh, practice a, a ritual and the ceremony and the ordinance of water baptism. We wonder sometimes, what does it mean? Well, baptism is a declaration of each person that comes into this baptistry where they say, I am a Christian. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also not only a declaration to God, to the angels of God, to the church, even to the devil, that I'm a Christian, but it's an identification. It identifies you openly with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also a time of obedience to the Word of God. The Bible tells us to believe and to be baptized. And so to be baptized is to follow through in obedience to what God has told us to do. So today, these three that are being baptized are declaring, identifying, and obeying God. So I ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you allow us to declare our faith openly as Christians, that you make baptism one of the first steps of our obedience, our identification, our declaration to you, that we belong to you. I pray that you'll bless this time of baptism, bless this confession of faith, bless this profession of water baptism this morning. Thank you, my Lord Jesus, for putting it into effect, putting it into practice. And I ask you, God, to bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Ann Wallace Bishop, and she made a profession of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she declares that profession of faith that Jesus has come to live in her heart. Now, Ann Wallace says, I baptize you this morning is an assurance that Jesus lives in your heart, that the rest of your life belongs to him. Okay, good. <laughs> Some of us are not verbal. Right. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is Weston Whaley. Weston came to my office after uh, asking his parents a lot of questions, wanting to make a profession of faith, wanting to know how to become a Christian, and we talked about a lot of things. And so today, Weston, as I baptize you, it is an assurance in your heart that you're Christian, that you know you're saved. Then I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is Megan Carwile, and Megan Carwile was was in my office not too long ago and made a profession of faith. She wanted to get it straight 
be assured in her heart that she was a Christian and she made that profession of faith, admitted she was a sinner and asked Jesus to forgive her sins, come live in her heart. And now Megan has baptized you today is an assurance that your life belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, and I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Join me in prayer again. Father, we thank you for the glory that you give us this day, your day to worship you, to love you, to celebrate you, to sing to you and praise you and give to you, to be here to honor you. And God, we thank you for this church. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in it. And we ask God that you bless this service today. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Up here in the choir done parted like the Red Sea. I, I kind of like that though. I know what it was. They y'all think they did that so y'all could see better and they wouldn't detract. No, it's because a lot of times when they get in there, their feet kick up and they go to kicking and they get wet. So they learn to to get out of the way. So uh, are y'all gonna squeeze back together? I wish y'all did. Y'all go and make like an accordion sound when they all march in. Well, I just did, but. Uh, <laughs> It wouldn't be as good as if they did it, but anyway, I uh, want to welcome everybody here. This is a really good crowd here on the Lord's Day, so we're glad you're here. Uh, may have folks that are visiting today to just be part of this baptismal service. We welcome y'all, and what a special thing that to see the Lord's uh, folks coming to the Lord and being obedient in baptism. So thank y'all for being here and, and being part of that. It, it's an awesome thing. A uh, lot of stuff in the bulletin, so and, but I've got a couple of things I'm going to go over. This is uh, Vacation Bible School, June 20th through June 24th, be 545 each afternoon or each evening. Uh, there will be a meeting for all the volunteers that are going to work in VBS on May the 15th after church, uh, two Sundays from now. And uh, also... 5-11, May 11th, is the last night for Dig In and Be Bold for the kids on Wednesday nights. And so then that leads into this note right here, need volunteers for the summer Wednesday nights for our, for our kids or the children. Uh, and that'll be on Wednesdays at 6.30, and they'll start the summer program on May the 18th. So uh, get in touch with Susan or the church office, let anybody know if you're interested in helping with those Wednesday nights in the summer program. Uh, welcome to everybody, but I'm going to welcome Brother Harry Bryan. This is our Gideon Sunday here at Anchor Baptist Church, and we welcome Brother Harry because he is our Gideon. Uh, you know, there are Gideons here, or there, and yonder, but he's our Gideon, and uh, we want to keep getting you back here every year, Brother Harry. You're just from across the river anyhow, right? So you're kind of like an anchor person, Taylor person, but we're, we're kind of claiming you here at Anchor, so... Pipe down for, I, I, I may not claim you as an anchor, but no, sir, we love you, Brother Harry, and you do a great job representing the Gideons, and uh, I hope when you saw a Gideon speaker, you didn't go, oh, it's a Gideon, but Brother Harry gives the word of God, and he, he does it with Gideon facts and figures, but uh, he presents the gospel as well, so that's why we are proud to have him with us on our Gideon Sunday. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Miss Janet, can you come here a minute? Come here, Janet. I didn't know this because, I mean, I thought she had been playing our piano like two, three years. They said it. Come on. I'm not going to do nothing. <laughs> said she's been playing the piano for 10 years today. Will you vouch for that? Seem longer? <laughs> longer? I had, though, besides our being our church pianist, that she also is considered a, the assistant choir director, the choir boss. <laughs> right, Richard? I got that from Richard. But uh, Janet, we love you and what you add to our service and how you have just taken up, blended in, 
uh, we don't even mind that you bring Richard with, not that Richard, but your Richard with you. <laughs> Uh, he draws pictures on his Sunday school uh, record envelope that he brings to us, and we have to interpret every Sunday, so keep bringing him. We like that. And this is just a little token of our love and, and uh, expression of thank you for being here and doing what you do for us at Anchor. You want to make a speech? Good deal. Thank you, Janet. We love all of y'all. But here, one other thing, we're going to we're gonna receive a Gideon offering uh, today after the service. So if you exit back out the foyer back there, uh, we'll have men with the offering plates, but they're going to be receiving the regular tithes and offerings. But we'll have a couple of ushers with open Bibles, and you can place any gift you'd like to give to the Gideons in one of those uh, open Bibles back there, and we'll get that to Brother Harry. But uh, we'll let our children go to Children's Church right now, so let's, let's send them out with a word of prayer. Y'all pray with me. Lord, this is a great Sabbath day, Lord, and uh, we just give you the glory for all of it. Father, we just thank you for being able to witness the ordinance of baptism. Lord, we are so proud for Ann Wallace and Weston and Megan, Lord, for this statement, this declaration they've made in their lives today, Lord, that... They're doing this openly and outwardly, Lord, so the world and the devil and everybody knows that they've got Jesus in their heart, and we rejoice for that fact. Father, we just pray that many others will make that same claim before it's too late, Lord. We thank you for Brother Harry coming to us today to bring that great message of the work that the Gideons do around the world, Lord, in placing the Holy Bible in places that uh, others can't get to. Father, we just pray that you would continue to bless the Gideon work. Just help us to give to support it today while we have this opportunity, Lord, because your word does go out and does not return void. Father, we just uh, we pray for our church. We pray that we continue to serve you and that we let you guide and lead us in all that we do, Lord, and that you always receive credit for anything that happens here. We anticipate a great Bible school. Lord, we pray that uh, you furnish the workers for that. We pray for the Wednesday night when the children are, are visiting and, and meeting during the summer. Lord, we just pray that you continue to, to grow them in faith and steer them toward claiming Jesus uh, at the right time. Father, we just pray you add your blessings to our service today. We turn it over to you. We ask you this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be here with you all. I'm so glad we got to recognize Janet this morning. She helps me out more than you all will ever know. Uh, we're going to open our service here singing a call to worship, a medley, heaven medley. When the roll is called up yonder, when we all get to heaven, and I'll fly away. If you'll stand as we sing. When the trumpet on the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over all the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll see 
sing and shout the victory. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. standing for our scripture reading. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 119, 130, Psalm 119, 11, and Matthew 24, 35. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly <coughs> Father, as we see from our passages today, even a simple person like me can accept your word and keep it in our heart and it will never disappear. But as you've said in the Bible, we have to be able to hear the word. And people like Brother Harry are those that spread that word across the world. We pray you would bless their ministry, Lord. Be with him as he brings our message today. And keep us safe as we leave. Forgive us when we sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next hymn will be uh, Days of Elijah, and we'll end with You Are My All in All. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And mean these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and God of Zion still salvation. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world. We are your laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. 
seeking you as a precious tool. Lord, to give you might be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in
Amen to that. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. For those of you who may not know who I am, I'm Harry Bryan. I grew up, and I make no, make no apologies for being born and raised up over at Taylor. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad to be here, and God has blessed me down through the years, and I'm so glad that he called me into the ministry of Gideon's International. Tom Moore had finished making an estimate for a roof for the doctor's office building, and he and the doctor were talking when Tom looked over and spotted a Gideon Bible on the doctor's desk. And he said, you know, that Gideon Bible saved my life. Caught off guard, the doctor asked Tom, said, why he felt that way? Tom told him the following story. He said he and four buddies planned a night of drinking and partying. And while waiting on him, he picked up a Gideon Bible at the motel room where he was and began to read. And he read out of Luke 15, 11 through 32, which deals with the story of the prodigal son. He realized that this story fit him perfectly. And he continued his reading in the first chapter of Matthew about the lineage of Jesus. He read John 3, 16 through 17. When his buddies knocked on the door, he never answered. Rather, he chose to stay in his room and continue reading God's word. Later, there was a knock on the door, and when he opened it, he saw two North Carolina state troopers who asked him if he knew these young men, and they repeated their names to Tom. And Tom asked him why were they inquiring about his friends. They told him that his friends had been involved in an accident. And the trooper then told Tom, they're all dead. Tom said the only thing he remembered that was taking that Gideon Bible from the motel room that night. He said he was still in shock and disbelief when he walked into a little country church that Sunday and he turned his life over to Jesus Christ. He struggled with old addictions. And after that, God cleaned him up and eventually called him into the ministry. When the doctor asked Tom about what happened to that Bible, Tom told him that he still reads it every day. That's just an example of how God can take out a broken life and take people like Tom, people like me, and save them. As the song says, I don't deserve the least of his favor, but Jesus left heaven for me. He accepted me. I haven't done anything but be evil and be a sinner. All of us have sinned, and the Bible tells all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us in here needs Jesus Christ. And I am so happy to see those three young souls be baptized this morning. That's what it's all about, and thanks so much. That's great. And that's just a sign of Somebody in this church is working, and they're praying. And you pray for those people that are lost. And pray for me as I try to do a Gideon message this morning and share with you how God has blessed the Gideons International. You know, we have been in this the business of Gideons, have of distributing Bibles for 200 years now. And it all started back in Moscow, Wisconsin, back in 1899. And... Um, 98, in fact, in 1899, there were three guys, and soon in 1908, uh, a Presbyterian minister decided uh, that uh, he would, thought it would be a good idea if his church, Presbyterian church up there in that part of the world, would uh, make it available for, for people who, travelers, as they called them, to have a, a Gideon Bible or a Bible to read in the hotel or motel. They didn't have motels back in those days. There were hotels. So that's what they did, and that's the beginning of the Gideon ministry, is how we started placing Bibles in the traffic lanes of life, and that's what we still do. Strangely enough that uh, some of the countries that we have been able to distribute God's Word in have, have shut the, the doors to us, and they don't let us in there anymore. But uh, God is still working, and He's still blessing us. More than... Four million confirmed refugees now have fled the neighboring countries over there where all the 
the chaos is going on in six million to remote parts of Ukraine. Over 100,000 scriptures have been delivered to members in surrounding countries with the potential to distribute, distribute many more as the need is so great. Additionally, almost 300,000 scriptures were moved from the central storage in Kiev to different cities in Western Ukraine, where hundreds of thousands of refugees are searching for help and for shelter. You know, that's a sad thing that we need to pray about. We need to pray for those people. And strangely enough, it might interest you to know that in this country, the Ukraine, there are 2,100 Gideons residing in that country. And what is still more amazing, it was to me, I never really thought about this, but do you know that there are 3,300 Gideons residing in Russia? And they are subjected to all kinds of abuse and, and you know, because they name the name of Jesus and they stand for, for Jesus Christ. And they suffer a lot but they are faithful to their duties in the country of Russia. So pray for these people and for the safety of all the people, and that peace will come soon. Pray also that God might use the unrest there to draw many to him to do presently know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and that those who do not know him will come, and those that do know him will find comfort in his word, because there is comfort and peace in the word of God. You know, there are several reasons why Gideon's International differs from our traditional missionaries. Uh, one is that the Gideon's live and serve in the local communities where they live. You know, in countries across the world, uh, we don't have uh, people like me over there. They are, we have Gideon's that live there, and they do the same thing over there that I do. They just speak a different language and do things a little bit differently, but they're still doing it. And they know the local language and the customs. And they know the location of the motels, hospitals, prisons, and other places where they can distribute the scriptures. And the Gideons are able to establish local groups in countries where traditional missionaries aren't allowed to go. You know, we have some people that are missionaries that would be glad to go some of these countries, but they don't allow them. So we have Gideons there that are doing that. What do we believe is Gideons? I've shared this many times with you, and you probably remember some of it, and some of you may not. But here's what we do. The Bible is what we believe is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. We know that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, and have received Him as our personal Savior. And we are men who endeavor to follow Him in our daily lives, and men who believe in the endless lake of fire. We are men who accept the biblical standard of marriage between one man and one woman. We're men in good standing with an evangelistic church or congregation or assembly. And also, we are men who participate in the activities of the camp. There's an ongoing emphasis of fulfilling the seven, seven spiritual objectives, and here they are. We are men of the book. We are men of faith. We're men of prayer, men of a separate walk, men with a compassionate heart, and men who witness and men who give. We give ourselves, we give money to the Gideons internationally, and that purchases scriptures. You know, God has blessed this ministry for 120 years, yet the history of the Gideons International reveals that in our formative years, the ministry was not about scripture distribution, strangely enough. Its primary focus was this, a man who is before God and the strength and the power of his testimony, Christ. Why were we formed as a ministry? We were formed to help Christian business and professional men maintain a strong testimony for Christ. Today, we face new challenges considering the rapid moral decline of our post-Christian societies of the world. And I'll throw this in while I'm thinking about that. This past week or so, uh, I was on the campus, the university, and we gave scriptures out two days, or Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and I went on Tuesday. And that had been, I guess, probably three years since, uh, uh, Brother Gerald, since we were able to do a distribution because of the pandemic and all of this stuff. And over that three-year period, I observed a decided change in the attitude of those people on the campus and students. And I observed in what I think 
is what Scripture tells us in the, in the end times. There will be a great falling away, and I'm observing it every day. You observe it in your churches. Thank God. This church hasn't fallen to that. But I have spoken in churches where you look out over the congregation, it's like looking at a lumber yard with so many empty seats. And then they tell you, well, we've been afraid of the pandemic. We can't do that, but it doesn't affect their going to Walmart. And they do everything else. That's just a lame excuse. But it's just a part of what Scripture tells us, I think, in the, in the end times. There'll be a great falling away. And I think, Brother Gerald, that's what we are in right now. We're at the beginning of it. And even in our government, they have made concessions to people that we don't even want to associate with. And they have made this okay for all of these things that they put a stamp of approval on there that I don't approve of as a Christian, as a citizen of this country. But God is still in control. He knows our needs, and he knows what I am thinking, and he knows what I'm going to do from one day to the next, one second from the next. And he proved his love for us before the foundation of the world. When he came into the Garden of Eden that morning, you remember the story about Adam and Eve? And he came in and he called out, Adam, where are you? And he said, we were hiding. Why were you hiding, Adam? Because we were naked. Well, who told you you were naked? And God knew what they had done. And it says in the scriptures, and God clothed them in tunics. One little short message. Prior to that, they had tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. And that represents man's attempt to try to cover his sins. And it's temporary, it doesn't last. God clothed them in tunics, skins. And the Bible doesn't mention this, but this is my summation of how this happened and what happened in that garden that day. And I think that there were little lambs, and I think it was a lamb because the Bible uses Jesus as the Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world, and it speaks of lambs throughout the Scriptures. And I think that God, in the presence of Adam and Eve, had to slay those little harmless animals. And their blood had to be shed so that he could make skins to cover their physical nakedness as the blood of Jesus Christ covers our spiritual nakedness. And that's what I derive from that story in the book of Genesis. I didn't read that anywhere. God revealed that to me. And it came because when I was still working for the state, I was traveling up in northeast Mississippi, and I went to a headquarters of a supervisor's headquarters one day, and I got ready to leave, and there was a young man there who said, uh, well, by the way, he said, Mr. Harris said, uh, I have a, a set of, of uh, scriptures here, little testaments that uh, have a spare a, a set of copies. And he said, well, would you like them? And I said, yeah, I sure would. And he was telling me about a little preacher, this Pentecostal preacher was doing a Bible study at his church. And he said, and he said that uh, he made the statement, Brother Gerald said, and God created the first blood sacrifice. And that's where I got the idea that I just shared with you about the Garden of Eden. Those skins just didn't disappear. Something had to die. And then it says in Hebrew, according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood by the shedding of blood. There is no remission, no forgiveness for sins. And that's what Jesus did. He died. Save folks like me. Folks like you. For the foundation of the world, he came seeking to save that which is lost. You know, uh, I'd like to share another uh, one of my testimonies with you. This is a, one that I just got here recently. And this was one was issued by a, a gentleman from Ger Germany. He said, I was working for the National Health Department when the Gideons came to visit in 2011. And they were not allowed to enter. And due to my position, I took care of the situation. I apologized for the confusion and helped them to unload and spread the scriptures. At this time of life, I was far from God. Our experience together was short, but I encountered the gospel and Christian brotherhood for the first time that day. As a result, I repented and committed my life to the Lord. I began studying God's word, he said, and even started a mission-based Bible study. 
This bore much fruit as I could partner with many pastors and missionaries to glorify the kingdom. God used Gideon's to change me. As I continued to grow in my faith, I felt called to ministry and became a pastor. I thank God every day that Gideon's invested their time to reach people like me. When you give to Gideon's, folks, that's what your money is used for. We purchased Bibles like this, a full-size Bible. That would cost five bucks. And a little Gideon New Testament that I carry around in my pocket costs a dollar and a quarter. And we pass them out to people on a regular basis. And that's what we do is Gideon's. That's what we use the money for. We don't get anything paid. I don't get paid for traveling around doing Gideon messages. Whatever I do for Gideon's, I, I pay my own way. Everybody does. And Carol and I give to the Gideons, and we give as much as the Lord directs us to. And we know that that money is used to buy scriptures. On December 22nd, 2021, it says we all got to the cardiac center at Covenant Hospital in Lubbock, Texas. We received a stunning shock to learn the gravity of the condition of my sister, He said she, at noon, had gotten back into her intensive care unit and having undergone some exploratory procedures. In those procedures, one of the arteries to her heart had collapsed. And when we first saw her, she retained a lot of fluids and had too many complications to even count. She was showing very little response. And at about 3.30 in the afternoon, one of the chaplains escorted us into a small room just around the corner from the ICU and and gave us a terrible report. The way that I felt when I left the room was if the chaplain had just come out and said, what would you like to do with the body? His circumstances looked bleak and hopeless. At about 6 o'clock, everyone left to go and get rooms and a couple of hours rest before returning. I decided to stay at the hospital, and I had no idea of Pat's relationship with God. I've sometimes heard with people in a state like Pat could still hear. So at 7 p.m., I began telling her how to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. After I'd finished, I still felt frustrated because I didn't know if she could hear me. The only thing that I could think of was to read God's Word. He said, I I went into that room waiting and grabbed a Bible that the Gideons had left there and went back into Pat's room. I stood there beside her bed and began reading scriptures to her, and I read to her Ephesians and then continued reading until I finished the book of Philippians. From that time forward, every measurement started to move in the positive direction. She started to respond to touch, and her hands began to warm up. God, in his mercy, intervened in our sister's situation and gave her a body healing, and he saved her life. I've also learned that she accepted or reaffirmed Jesus Christ as her Savior sometime after her surgery, and that that is the victory she was given new life. Situations like this tend to be held. Us all realize, help us realize how fragile life really is, how quickly our lives can be over. We're not guaranteed anything. After once we leave out that door, we don't know. God knows. After Gideon's distributed New Testaments in my school, he said some of the kids started a scripture memory contest. He said, I didn't go to Sunday school, but I hung around with these same kids, so I joined the contest. My dad threatened to burn my New Testament, but my mother stopped him. I memorized verses with the other kids, but I still did not attend Sunday school. Later, I accepted Christ, and I told the pastor that I wanted to become a Christian because of reading my New Testament from the Gideons and memorizing the verses. Since then, my father has threatened to kick me out of my home if I go to church anymore. He even bought me a motorbike under the conditions that I would give up my new religion. I refused to accept the bike. And I told my dad, as much as I'd like to have the bike, I'd never give up Jesus for it. Isn't that sad that we have parents that are that cruel and that that lost? You know, we don't know what goes on homes around the world and about, but the best thing we can do from day to day is we need to pray for people, pray for the lost people in our country. 
even next door to us. I have people living next door to me on both sides over there in Batesville. And uh, I can assure you that on the west side over there, they have never darkened the church door. And they have small children. And it's sad. And I try to talk to them and influence them in a positive way, but they didn't. It's just like speaking to that door over there. No response. But anyway, God has a way and he has a plan for everybody. You know, there was a drug lab hidden down in the jungles of Columbia. And in it were many chemicals. And this is an amazing story. That was filled with guns, dangerous men. But the lab was different because it also contained a Gideon New Testament. The Testament was so popular, believe it or not, with the 40 people who were in that lab that they would argue about who would get to read it. Isn't that something? Well, to prevent these fights, they had to draw lots. So each one of them would have time to read one little New Testament. This drug lab no longer exists there in South America. But you can find the individuals who used to work there. All 40 of them were saved from that single little Gideon New Testament. And here's something else. Out of that, 12 of them became pastors. One little scripture. So you see, when you give a dollar, two dollars, or whatever you give to Gideon's International, and it buys a scripture, you never know what one little scripture might do and how it would be used by God to bring someone into his kingdom. This lady, name is April Westbrook. She said, I was placed on a prayer list early 1976 out there in Texas. And she said, those Baptist ladies prayed for me fervently. I was very lost and under deep conviction. Not long after that, I had to go into the hospital where I was there to read a paperback Gideon New Testament. You all have seen them. We put them in Bibles in, in the hotels, motels, really hardbacks in motels. And she said, I was released from the hospital before I finished the book, so I stole it. A few weeks later, I was invited to church where I became a Christian. By that time, I had read the Gideon New Testament repeatedly. One day, the Lord spoke to me. He told me to take that New Testament back to Mercy Hospital. This upset me very much, she said, and I took the bus to the city. At the hospital, I went in and put the Testament on a coffee table and ran back out, and I cried the entire bus ride home. She said, when I got back home, I didn't know what I was going to read. Little did I know, one of the church ladies had left a Bible for me while I was out. I was overjoyed, and God is so very good. I said, thank you for your precious ministry. You have no idea how God uses what you do. I have led many people from many nations to Christ because of that stolen book. God bless all of you. Signed, April Westbrook from Cleburne, Texas. You see, God is not short in what he can do. He can do wondrous things wondrous things. And he can save someone like me. He can save anybody. You know, for, for years and years, I labeled under the false belief that uh, I was okay. And I know some of you may have experienced this. And I, I went about doing my business and everything, and I, you know, I just pretty well ignored for a long time, ignored God completely in my life. And I lived in a way that I've I'm, I'm or and I'm, I'm totally ashamed of it. The veteran 20 years ago, when I was still working as an investigator with the state, I was driving on Highway 315 up the northern end of Panola County, and it goes over to Highway 3. And uh, I was working a case over there and had to cross over, in the, over into uh, Quitman County. And uh, there's a little creek that runs under Highway 315 over there. It's uh, south, and, uh, south and east of uh, a town over there in uh, Crenshaw in Panola County called Indian Creek. 
Brother Gerald, as I crossed Indian Creek, uh, I had my car radio tuned to a 640 in Memphis. It's a Christian station up there. It's AM 640. And there was a, a preacher. Ironically, ironically, this preacher, he lives out in Texas now, but he was born and raised in Laurel, Mississippi. And he was preaching a message that hit me. I'll never forget it. God used that message to reach me and to tell me that I was way out on that left field. I thought I had done everything right, and you, you would think that I was really some kind of saint if you had known me before, back in those days. And I had done this, and I'd been having these different jobs and sung in the choir and everything in the church. Brother Gerald, but you know that. That doesn't get it, does it? I was convicted that I was a sinner and I needed Jesus Christ. And I prayed and accepted him. Going down Highway 315. And since then, my life has not been the same. Not to say that they don't have problems. They do. Everybody does. But maybe there's somebody here today who you may be not be maybe not sure of, of your salvation. But those three that were baptized this morning is proof that God loves you. And that water is a sign that He washes away your sins. And He washed away my sins and He forgave me. And it still haunts me a lot of times. Maybe you do too. You think back. How could I have thought this? How could I have said this? Why? How could I have done this? And I'm reminded. And Satan always brings up something, you know, and he tries to point an accusing finger at you, you know, and make you doubt what God has done in your life. But God's already settled that question a long time ago. He is the lover of your soul. He loves you. Loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for your sins. When he was up there in heaven, you know, he left heaven. Come down here and live amongst us for 33 years. He was tempted in all points, just like you and I are, yet without sin. And he lived a, a sinless life. And then man took him and abused him and killed him beat him and treated him in every bad way you can think of. Nailed his hands with nails to the cross and his feet with nails. Can you imagine the pain that, that he, had, he had hanging up there with the weight of his body on those nails? And people spitting on him laughing at him and ridiculing him in every kind of way. But yet Jesus had the love in his heart to ask the Heavenly Father to forgive them for they know not what they do. And he cried out from the cross and he asked God to forgive him. And then he passed away. And his death wasn't just ordinary. The earth shook and trembled. And it turned dark because it's dark without Jesus. And that's what happened. The sun went out. It stayed out like that for about six hours, I think. And all of that occurred. And Jesus died. And he did that for you. And for me. And what is so comforting to know is that Jesus, once you ask him to save you and accept you, he wipes your slate clean. He paid your sin debt. 
He paid a sin debt that he didn't know. When I incurred one, I can never repay. But I can thank him for what he did. And I do that through the Gideons International. It's just one small way that I have of thanking Jesus for what he did for me. And it's people like your pastor here that is, opens his pulpit to people like me to come give the Gideon story and tell you what we do. And it's people like you who have the conviction to give what you can to Gideon so that the monies that you give can be used to purchase Bibles like this that are given to a lost and dying world. People like I was. And this is a great, wonderful book. This Bible here costs five bucks. And the little Bibles, I told you, the little uh, Testaments cost a dollar and a quarter apiece. And we'll give them out. I gave them out uh, uh, this past, uh, as I told you earlier, to, to the university. We gave out 1,900 copies, but that's not close to what we used to give out. But 1,900 people got them, and God will use them. And I just want to thank you all for allowing me to share with you once again how God has used Gideon ministry and how he uses the Gideons to bring about his word and bring the, the news, the good news, and the saving news to a lost and dying world. And we are operating now, as I told you earlier, in 200 countries and pray that God will continue to use Gideon's International, that he'll continue to bless us as he has done. And I can assure you that I would be in prayer for you folks and for this congregation and for your pastor because you folks are very, very special to me. Uh, I've spoken more times at this church than any church I have ever spoken at since I've been in Gideon. And I always just look forward to coming back to this church and seeing all of you and thanking you so much. God bless you. And I hope and pray that you will continue to be faithful. Thank you, Brother Pastor, for allowing us to come back. I want to thank Brother Harry for being here with us. He's our Gideon. We have him every year. We'll continue to have him as long as he's able to come and willing to come. He's presented to you some testimonies of how God uses the Gideon organization. The Gideon, Gideon organization loads God's gun. The, the Bible is the word of God. It's the sword of the spirit. It contains in it the power to change people's lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we allow our lives to be changed by the word of God, and it's never changed outside the word of God, we need to make sure that we pass that word on. And the way we do that through the Gideons is gifts. So I urge you to be generous with your offerings, with your donations, to the Gideons today. Now let me ask you to stand. If there is a person here who may not be sure of their salvation, Brother Harry has presented the gospel, the good news of Christ this morning. And let me give you the opportunity to receive Christ today. Let's just, uh, I want just our instrumentalists playing softly. You bow your heads as we observe a time of invitation today. You respond to God as he'd have you respond.
Thank you for being here with us. We thank Brother Harry for sharing that message with us from the Gideon organization, and we ask you to go by and, and have a word. Uh, welcome Brother Harry here again and, and have a word with him. He'll be glad to talk to you. And uh, let me ask you to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care for us and that you speak to us, that through the word of God, we might have your mind your battle plan, your strategy, what you think and how you act, what place you have for us in your plan. And I pray, God, that you'd bless the Gideon organization as you've blessed them already. God, as we live in a world that's upside down morally, ungodly, we know that you're in control of us and we're in your plan. We ask you, God, to use us as your people, as your church. And we ask you this, and we ask you this as we dismiss in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.